Welcome, I'm your host Lee Adams and today we have a very, very special guest with us today. Uh, when you think of Pittsburgh, what do you think about um, many things, the steel industry, but I think one of the first things you think about is the Pittsburgh Steelers. And when you think of the Pittsburgh Steelers, besides the Super Bowls and the great players and coaches, what do you think about? I think it's the Rooney family, the owners of the Steelers. And today, we, our special guest is a member of the Rooney family. He was also the architect of some of the greatest drafts in Steeler history that some consider were some of the greatest drafts in NFL history. He's also the author of Rouhani, the, the story of Art Rooney and his clan. I'd like to introduce Mr. Art Rooney, Jr. Mr. Rooney, it's great to have you. Good morning. Uh, now, Mr. Rooney, what was the impetus behind uh, writing the book? Well, um, there were these great stories about my dad and his family and his friends and acquaintances. And uh, I uh, had a friend from Sports Illustrated, Mort Sharnick, who met my father and came to the premises. We were at... Uh, in the old uh, Roosevelt Hotel at the time, you know, right before we went to Three Rivers. And uh, Mr. Sharnick was just so taken with the uh, environment there. And he said, you know, you have to start writing these things down uh, because he said, believe me, they will be lost. The stories will be lost, the characters will be lost. And uh, he kept after, after me to do this for decades. And finally, when I turned 60 years old, uh, I just started to write down in various journals. You know, the, uh, you know, I had a, uh, you know, the family journal, you know, uh, chronologically, you know, you know, from the early days on, and then I had a football type journal, and then I had a miscellaneous journal in case you got a good story that didn't fall into one of those, uh, those uh, classifications, and I, I just kept at, kept after it. But I, the big thing was, I wanted to share, preserve, and share these stories. Now, this is a second in a series of interviews we're doing with you, and where we, where we ended last time was right at the time where you were going into the Marines. And uh, what made you want to go into the Marines? Well, I had gone to drama school at Carnegie Tech and then on to a studio in New York. And um, uh, in those days, you got drafted. You're too young to remember that, but uh, uh, I, I got out of college and... Uh, 57, and uh, you, you had a military military obligation for two years, and uh, or you could go into the reserves for uh, I guess it was six years, you know, six months on active duty, and the rest of the time like uh, two weeks or a month each year. And so I, I was a North Side guy, you know, and a real macho around the Steelers, and I, I got into the Marines and um, the reserves. I went to see if I was still tough. Well, I went to the Marine Corps, and they were the greatest guys you could ever want to meet. Uh, they were all John Wayne, the real, real, the real article. And um, uh, they were tough. I found out I was never tough. I just had to do my utmost just to keep up with those guys. Well, but you had a pretty good experience there. I, I think some people complimented you on how you handled yourself. Isn't well, that right? the, the, the thing, thing that happened was that uh, I was just a, such a big, fat guy. And, uh, you know, just to get in shape, it was a major thing. And I was the worst marcher in the world, you know. And, uh, uh, and uh, it was interesting. It's funny. Looking back now, it was interesting and funny. At the time, it was hell. When they found out you were somebody, and even the Steelers didn't have a good team and it was not as big as now, well, they wanted someone to pick on all the time. And here's this uh, fat, rich kid, you know. And, uh, you know, so they, they kept after me day and night, you know, and I am not exaggerating about that all the time. And uh, finally they got me in tremendous shape, you know, physical shape, and uh, I could keep up and uh, move around pretty good. And, you know, a couple, when we were leaving Paris Island and going up to Camp Lejeune, uh, the guy I was sitting on, on the bus, he wasn't particular, particularly a great friend of mine, nor did he ever become that. And uh, so when we were just about, you know, up to uh, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, Paris Island was in South Carolina, he says, hey, Rooney, before uh, we get off this bus, I have to tell you something. I said, what? He says, you were the toughest guy in the whole thing. He said, you took more, everything they gave out, it gave to you and even more. And that, that was pretty, oh, I remember it after all these years. Sure, that guy saying sure. That. Those but I, I'm sorry that I, I have to say that I was not the greatest Marine. I'm not talking about... <clears throat> about uh, 
deportment. I was a you know an ideal uh, yes sir no sir guy. You know, do what you're said, but but I, I wasn't the greatest performer. I never did learn to march. You know. Well, my brother went to Paris yeah. Island, and uh, it, it it really turned his life around. Yeah. I mean, based on uh, history and our history of our mm -hmm. family. Now, what did you learn from yourself doing that, going through the Marines? The, the, the thing about that, Lee, is that I really was, you know, from an affluent family. You know, my dad never wanted us to even believe that. We lived on the north side, but we lived in one of those old mansions on the north side that my mother kept up like it was still one of those old mansions. And, um, and you always had identity. Your dad owned the Steelers. He put on the boxing matches and things like that. And we always had a walking around money and things like that. And, uh, but you got down there, it was just you. And they didn't, they didn't give a darn, you know, who your daddy or mommy was or anything. Now, maybe you're some big politician, but I never experienced that. And, um, and as I said, they kind of uh, wanted to make an example of somebody. And I was an ideal guy to do it because I was overweight. And, uh, you know, I, I couldn't distinguish my left foot from my right foot. And, uh, but uh, they, they really, you know, whip you into shape and it made me believe that, uh, you know, I can, uh, yeah, I can take care of myself. And, In a uh, tough situation. Yeah, it was, it was not a very tough situation with a bunch of tough guys, you know. It doesn't uh, get much tougher than that. Well, they, they, that was a real experience at, uh, you know, Paris Island. Uh, if you, you know, if you went, I guess even now, if you went through it, it uh, you're, it's a special, special yeah. type thing. I don't yeah. think it's changed that much. Yeah. now. You know, you, you speak about being somebody in Pittsburgh and part of the Rooney family. You know, I, I wonder, what is that like? Uh, you walk around Pittsburgh, and I guess some people would recognize you, and you have some celebrity status. Is that hard not to go to your head? And But I guess your dad was pretty good about the values yeah. he taught you. Yeah, my father and mother, especially my dad, you know, didn't, don't be putting on the dog. Don't be. Don't be thinking that you are somebody you weren't. You're a North Side guy. You're a Pittsburgher, and always kept on hitting that into you. And uh, uh, it, it, it's funny that uh, I'll, I'll be in Pittsburgh and somewhere, and somebody will look at me and say, "I know you from somewhere." <laughs> I don't know who I am. Do I know? Or people will say, "Do I know you?" you know, and uh, I said, "I don't know." I went to a store one time in the, <clears throat> one of the department stores and. Uh, of course, I've always had battles with my weight, and I bought something, and uh, it was a small thing. I don't remember what it was, and uh, and the gal took my credit card, and she looked at it and says, "My God, you're a biggie." And I says, "No, lady, I'm not a biggie. I just look like a biggie." I said, "I'm a son of a biggie," and so she thought that was the greatest thing going. She called all her girlfriends over. She said, Here, "Here's a son of a biggie." <laughs> <laughs> now, you also, interestingly, uh, tried to pursue acting. Uh, as a as a profession, talk a bit about where that came from, how that went, and how your family reacted to that. Well, you know, we we do have uh, you know that in our family. My my dad's first cousin is a gal named Ann Jackson, who's married to Eli Wallach. You know, probably is a, one of the great living actors, and uh, and Ann is a very very good actress too. You know, and. Uh, uh, but I'm just saying, maybe there was something genetic about that, you know. And uh, I just, I love movies and uh, got to like plays and I love theatrical literature. And, uh, and I just was in, in college and, uh, and I applied to a law school and I actually got in one of them, maybe two of them, I don't remember. And, uh, <clears throat> but I, I remember reading something that Churchill said that, because uh, I was a history major, you know. That the, the time to really take a chance is when you're really a young guy, you know, right out of college or whatever they would call it in England, yeah, you know, because that, that's when you can really uh, take a chance on something and you still have time to recover. And uh, so I, I auditioned at Carnegie, uh, was Carnegie Tech in those days, and it really was a great, and I'm sure it still is, a great drama school. And I, I got into the place and. Uh, but I, I had to start, it was a regular college, of course, and I had to start all over again as a uh, freshman. So I lasted about a, so to a, a sophomore, and uh, not even that, I, I, I mean that last semester. Then I, I moved on to New York to one of the studios there, and I studied with an old gal named Tamara Dekahanova, who had studied with Stanislavski. And, uh, and I worked with her for a year and a half, 
And then that, that's when I got the notice that I was being drafted. And I joined the Marine Corps. And um, that was very sobering, going to the Marine Corps. And, and uh, I, I think, uh, actually I got a job with the steward through my mother. You know, because even back then my dad always thought that you couldn't have too many of your kids working for the stewards because it would be trouble in the future. He was a very perceptive type guy. And, uh, but, you, you know, the theater, the Steelers, uh, if you love the Marine Corps, they all have a narcotic type of an effect on you. You know, if you, you know, luckily I got it with the Steelers. I didn't have it with the, uh, the uh, theater, and I didn't have it with the, uh, you know, you know, the, the, you know, the Marines, but when I worked with the Steelers, finally was lucky enough to get that job. It, it, it is, it's, you get addicted to it. And other people, though, are addicted to the, the horror. Other people, right. definitely with the theater. You know. yeah. But I was lucky. I did find something that became a, uh, a quest. Well, do you think if you weren't drafted by, did you ever think if you did not get drafted by the, uh, the, the military, yeah. what would have happened to you and your acting career possibly. Oh, I think I would have stuck that out for, for, for a while. And, and the other the thing about that is, Lee, that uh, um, I, I may not have been an actor or producer or director or anything, but, you know, there are other things connected with it. You know, like even here in the studio, you know, the, the, the uh, technical people. Although I'm all thumbs, I don't think that. But that's a good, good example. But, mm -hmm. you know, there are other things, like I was a, a Scott and I really did enjoy that. Heck, I, I may have been able to become a talent scout. I may have had a little talent for that. Because I was one of the only guys that thought Brad Shaw would make it as an actor. <laughs> because he had that, you know, that personality, you know, characteristics and that stuff. And he had the ability to laugh at himself. And I thought, you know, this guy just, just could do that. Did you know? see the movie he was in? Yeah, I saw it. Of course, of I especially went to see it. And he wasn't bad at all. He, in fact, I saw him and I said, gee, Manise, I said, you got to perform with like one of the great uh, American movie actors, uh, you know, the, the female lead. I said, just, you know, just a great What actress. was the movie called again, do you remember? Oh, I forget what I, it was. I did too. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. Now, you talk about the Steelers, starting with the Steelers, you say your mother got you that job. Talk oh, no about doubt it. about it. I mean, I like to say that uh, I did it. It was pure nepotism, you know, and uh, pure I, think, nepotism. I think they were afraid I was going back to the you know, get a job as an actor, and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I had met a beautiful red-headed gal, you know, from Seton Hill College who was a math teacher, and uh, they Where'd were... Where'd you meet her? At, at, at one of the university Catholic club dances or something like that they used to have in town, and, and she had gone to Seton Hill, and that was like the sister school to St. Vincent, where I went to college, and um, here the guy, my friend who had been my roommate at... Uh, St. Vincent, you know, had known this gal, and he introduced me to her, you know, and she was a, I was smitten, you know, beautiful redhead, you know, and, uh, you know, I was a guy just out of the Marine Corps. I looked pretty good, though, I say that, you know, I was in good shape. And, you were in uh, good you know, shape then. Yeah, you know, from my acting background, I had, a, you know, a knowledge of, you know, the theater, and, you know, I could carry on a pretty good conversation with somebody. A Pittsburgher then, you know. I, I really am a Pittsburgher now. You know, I've got, I forgot all that stuff. But you know, I could feel pretty good. At, you know, one girl came over to me and she said, uh, "You don't sound like your brothers," <laughs> yeah, because I had that little bit of a, a theatrical, you know, the, the addiction and things like that. And, but um, of course, I, I forgot that a long time ago. I'm, I'm still sound like a North Sider now. Yeah. <laughs> But you, you said, though, that when you met this girl, who I guess is now your wife. Yeah, Kathleen Coomer, yeah. And, and you felt like you needed to do something different as far as your career. Yeah, I don't think she had any use for me being an actor and living in uh, you know, some apartment in you know, New what York they call the cold water apartments six flights up in New York. And, yeah. Well, she went out and taught school. And she could have gotten the job easy because she was a math teacher. Mm, yeah. You know, she was getting all, all these offers, you know, and, uh, you know, that's, I was like my old, old man on the Steelers. You get a job and, uh, and so, we, you know, I ended up getting married and uh, my, my, we're, we've been married for 47 years mm, now. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, that is how about that. How yeah. about that? Now, you, you talk about your career with the Steelers. You got started, your mother got you the job, and I guess, uh, where did you start with the Steelers? I started promoting tickets, 
and that was the hardest job in the world to promote tickets for the Steelers in Forbes Field and Pitt Stadium. You know, because, uh, well, in Forest Field, there's only about uh, 15,000 good seats, and then maybe another seven that you could get by with, and the rest of them were horrible. And we hadn't won a darn thing since Jock Sutherland had, had a brief time with us before he died. And um, it, it was almost a fool's errand. And um, I, I got friendly with the scouts, the Steelers, and they, we really didn't have any full-time scouts. They were like uh, assistant coaches dash scouts. But uh, they were terrific guys, real down-to-earth guys, you know, uh, all played college football, and some of them have been pretty good players and that. And, and, uh, and, and I, I learned that, you know, you can, you, can, you can get the best talent in the world and still lose, but you will never win without the best talent. You had to get the best talent and have a methodology of getting it. And you had to get a coach who didn't mess them up. Right. And of course, when we ended up getting Chuck Knoll, he was more than not messing them up. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to talk about him down the road yeah. here. But one, I guess one of the big early influences for you from a scouting standpoint was Jack Butler. Yes. And no he, talk um, about him for a second as a player and then what he did from the scouting side. He, he was one of the great, great players of the Steelers. And he uh, had never played high school football. He was in the seminary, you know, studying to be a priest. And, um, and um, I, I was just sitting here trying to think what, what order he was. Uh, it wasn't the Franciscans, maybe like a Capuchin or something like that. It was up in Niagara Falls, uh, either Canada or Niagara Falls on our side of the border. <clears throat> and they had this seminary. And he was a, obviously a great athlete. And there's another guy in the seminary with him named Frank Thomas, the baseball player. And these two guys, and the, they were the terrors of the, uh, the intramural league at this Catholic uh, you know, uh, seminary. You know, they would have football, baseball, and all that stuff. And you know, the, the, you know Thomas and, and uh, Butler being on the same team, you know, both of them became you know, great pro athletes. You know. But uh, when Jack left the uh, seminary, he uh, Came down because his family, the Butler family, were friends of my dad and his brother, who was a Franciscan priest. But when uh, Jack left the seminary, he was looking for a college to go to, and uh, and so they brought him down to the steward office to talk to Jock Sutherland. And Jock Sutherland says, uh, "Well, he said you never played high school football and that stuff." He says, "Well, he said a good school for you. You're a very disciplined guy. Would be VMI." And Jack said he thought he was going to go to Duquesne because, uh, you know, he, he didn't want to be part of that military type regiment. He just got out of his seminary. But he, he, he went to uh, St. Bonnie's, and when he was up there, my uncle, Father Dan, who was Father Silas, it was a priest name, uh, said, hey, Butler, he said, you, uh, you, your dad was a real top uh, semi-pro baseball and football player. He said, yeah, maybe you inherited something off him. And, uh, he said, uh, why don't you come out and try it for the football team? They had good football there, by the way. And Jack was a guy, like I said, he was in the seminary. He never worked on his body, getting in shape. And he was just a skinny little kid. And so he went out for practice, and they wouldn't give him a uniform. You know, they said, uh, you know, we're going to have tryouts by invitation here. So he went, and here my uncle saw him on the campus, you know, that evening. He said, well, how would you like your first day of practice? He said, well, they wouldn't give me a uniform. So my uncle had to go and get him a uniform. You know, and so the first day he showed up at practice, and his roommate was a, uh, he, Jack did not know the positions on the team, you know, like guard, tackle. And he was built for an end, you know. And uh, the coach said, well, what position do you play, kid? And he said, offensive guard. It was because his roommate was a guard. And he's just a little guy, you know. And, uh, he said they lined him up, and he says, and uh, he got in a, in a real fight with the guy, you know, you know, just cleaning his clock. So he got in a big fight, and, he was, and so the coach came up and says, he says, well, it's obvious, obviously you're not an offensive guard. He said, but uh, you're a feisty guy. Let's put you at defensive end. Then they found out he could run. He was the fastest guy on the team. And then they found out he could catch the heck out of the ball. <laughs> and then they found out he was one of the toughest hitters they on the team. <laughs> And before it was over, he had a full scholarship, you know, and uh, I don't know if he had a four or five year deal there, 
But then, then when he got out of uh, St. Bonnie's, he was not drafted. And he came to Pittsburgh. My uncle got him a tryout with the Steelers. And he came in and played with the Steelers. And he was, uh, it was between him and another guy <clears throat> for the last cut. And here, the Lord must have had his hand on Jack's shoulder because the other guy got drafted into the Army. You know, and Jack made the team because he was the sole support of his mother. And he played for us for nine years and was, went to, uh, I think, five Pro Bowls. He was uh, all pro a few times and uh, played in the All-Star game, Pro Bowl, they call it now. He was a player, defensive player of the game, you know, and, uh, and uh, he had a very, very vicious uh, injury, you know, against the Eagles. And th that ended his career. And they gave him a coaching job, but uh, the, th the thing that happened to him with the coaching job, he couldn't get out of the way of the players. You know, as a defensive backfield coach, he was getting run over all the time. So Buddy Parker, uh, who was our head coach then, told uh, my father, he said, you know, he's a good guy, a smart guy, but he's going to get killed there. He said, we better, you know, make him an assistant coach dash scout. Yeah, so that's how he got into scouting. Well, I, I think that most interesting <clears throat> part of that story is that they, there was a point where they were not even going to give him a uniform. That's right. And had, was, was it Father Silas? Yeah. Had he not got him a uniform, mm -hmm. I don't know if any of that would have happened. I, I guess Jack would have been a salesman or a, yeah. a school teacher somewhere. You know, it's yeah. funny, the little things in little life, things in life it? where it yeah. could lead to. Yeah. And then he yeah. went on and made a great career yeah. for himself. Yeah, a great career. And... Uh, Ended up as the head of the Blessed Earth Scouting Organization, and he just retired last year at 80 years old. Wow. So there, there's a guy that got his, uh, probably by his sophomore year, had a free ride, they call it. Well, those football players don't get a free ride. They have to <coughs> earn those college for it, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the college education, had a profession in pro football for nine years, then a Scott uh, assistant coach, and then... Uh, well, I don't know. You uh, started out at uh, 19 years old, all the way until you're 80. Wow! You know, and um, had a profession. It's always been, been the greatest guy, and he pretty well taught me. Uh, there's other guys. Scotting you know, business. He pretty well was the main guy taught and me that. Blesto helped the Steelers quite a bit. Well, see, we had no coverage. By that I mean, you know, we we had these assistant coaches who were Scots. And, uh, and then we shared one guy with another team, and you, you just couldn't get more, could not get more than one or two scouting reports on a team. Well, when we got blessed, though, you know, that was um, at first three of them, four teams, Bears, Lions, Eagles, Towns uh, organization. Well, when you, each team had uh, two scouts, full-time scouts, you, you were getting eight, eight uh, areas covered. And you started to get these reports, and you couldn't believe it. You, you had uh, two, three reports uh, in the spring and fall, and your coach was got one. And you got to the point where you didn't have lack of information. You had to organize information. You were getting so many, much of it. And then you got other, uh, you, you, you hired, uh, got in other teams in Blesto. So you would have, you know, you know bigger or smaller areas, and then double ch guys double check. You know, so, you know, we really had the information. And by that time, I was going out in the road and scouting. And we brought Bill Nunn in, who was a newspaper guy, and had a real feel for it. And he, he was going, Yeah, and he was going at, at the scouting guy. So we, coverage was not our problem after that point. You know, it was good coverage. And then organizing the information you had, interpreting the information you had. But you also mentioned in the book, I believe, that not all the other teams in Blesto got the most out of Blesto. No, they didn't. They, but you they did. I, 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 yes, I did. And uh, because we were the founders of Blesto, uh, you know, Buddy Parker, and uh, I was working stiff with them. And as the years went by, I became the inventor of Blesto. And, you know, and I shouldn't be so truthful about it. Because I, I wasn't. <laughs> but I'll tell you, now it became so, it, it's so successful and it's still around, you know, and uh, they have another director of the thing, you know, since Jack retired. But um, 
You know, I should have said, yeah, yeah, I did that, but I didn't. Well, you know? but all those years in church, you know, yeah. they teach you to tell the truth. Yeah, well, I have some, some good effect there, but I, <laughs> I, I didn't uh, invent it, but I, had, I put an awful lot of time into it. And, uh, and I, I, I just worked with the Scots, you know, and I'd you know, travel and travel with them a little bit and take them to dinner. And we weren't talking about chasing girls or getting drunk or, you know, I didn't drink, you know, and uh, uh, I didn't chase girls either. But um, we talked football. And who were the best players I saw? And, you know, some guy in not my area, you know, that real good player over there. He says, I, you know, I, he really caught my eye. I like him, you know, or he's a sophomore and he's going to be real good. And so just loving your job, like I say, the, the narcotic effect. Yeah. You know, the passion for the job. You know, you just start, uh, it, it, it wasn't a job. It, it was a way of life. You know, it's interesting because you, you're sitting in a, in a chair that Frank Thomas sat in yeah. here not too yeah, long ago. Fra and Frank, we brought up his, his uh, classmate at Jack's. Yeah, <laughs> that, right. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah, and that's why, what yeah. really spurred me. Yeah. But Frank was very, you talk about not chasing girls. <laughs> Frank was very religious. He almost became a priest. I know that, yeah. And when he would... You know, when all the pirates were running around chasing girls, he was he was at home writing back to people that wrote letters to him and yeah. writing, you know, answering his fan yeah. mail. Uh, yeah. So it's interesting. So Jack was Jack Butler as straight laced as Frank Thomas was. He he was he is and at eighty he always will be. Yeah, I he's Mister Straight Laced. Yeah. They both, and I don't know if they ever kept up their. Uh, Friendship. I don't know if they're pals or anything, yeah. but, but evidently they're both very similar type guys. So he had a good he had a good influence on you then. Oh, tremendous! Jack Butler. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it was you know you had this stuff at home, you know your father and your uncle and, and my brothers and that stuff. Then you met a guy who was a great, great athlete. You know, one of the toughest guys that ever played. And he believed in all that stuff, you know, the, the clean life, the good yeah, life. You know yeah, I mean, and uh, had eight children, you know, and uh, uh, you know, and it, you know, it was a tremendous mentor because I had other guys I liked and were real good, and uh, you know, they'd be half loaded all the time. You know, I mean, or, or you didn't know what skirt they were chasing around, yeah. and you know, they, that wasn't your your you know, you, know, you had to know at a time well. You know, instead of hanging out, they were out somewhere else. You know, and they weren't bad guys. That's you know, they were they, right. they were football guys. You right. know what I mean? But Jack uh, was really a terrific guy that yeah. way. Oh, know? that's great. Now you know, you work for the Steelers, and some people thought you were well. We're on a payroll for family reasons, and you know, well, it probably started out that way. Well, yeah. yeah well, my question is, were they right? Uh, did you feel that attitude? Uh, around you, and did that, oh, yes. did that and, have any effect on you? Oh, yes, it did, because you, you felt that you had to prove something. You know, you had to prove that you were going to work harder than anybody. And, uh, and, and as I worked harder and then learned the business, I became rather pretty much of a bore about it, you know, because I'd let everybody know, and, you know, and, uh, you know, and I'd, throw my weight around a little bit. Now I, I was always a heavy guy, but you know, I'm not saying that, but because I, you know, I, the, to me the most important part of the steward organization was the scouting department. Because, as I say, you, you could lose with good football players, but you would never win without them. And but I don't know, know if it was always, people always thought that. No, no, they probably didn't, but I thought they did. Yeah. You know what I mean? The thing is how I perceived people, and I thought that, well, you know, because my dad got me the job, or my mother did, but, but uh, well, you never wanted to admit that either. In the old, old days, I never, now that, I tell you the truth, my mother got me the job, but, you know, it's because my dad, I had the job, and, uh, you know, I had something to prove, you know. And, uh, and, and again, it became a passion, it really did, and, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to get the very, very best players we could. And we're going to talk about some of those drafts in a, in, a, in a while. Now, just talk about your, briefly, can you just tell me about your other brothers and what career paths that they took? Well, Dan, of course, was an accountant from Duquesne University. And uh, he worked for the Steelers in the business part of it. And um, he, he was, we shared a passion. He uh, was just as passionate about, you know, having a great business as, you know, you know, business patterns and practices, as I was about the scouting department. And, uh, 
Uh, I, I thought it was a pretty good combination. You know, one on the football end of it, and the other one the uh, business end of it. And uh, uh, I don't. Uh, and my dad really was like the founder. You know, what I mean, the pioneer, and um, he was a great, great public relations man. But the big thing was is to win. You know, the credibility. It's so simple in that business. Credibility came with success. And, uh, and my dad did realize that. You know, he had brought Jock Sutherland in. What terrible luck to have the guy die, you know, uh, after just two years he had a brain tumor. You know. It's amazing as a little aside to you. I just had a call late last week from Bill Dudley, you know, our great all, you know, uh, you know, Hall of Fame football player, and he was with us about four or five years, but he had a falling out with uh, Sutherland and left, and, and he says, what, he asked me, and he's very elderly now, his mind's okay, but he's very elderly, and he says, what do people say about me? What do they say about me? And I didn't want to tell them, they don't say too much about you because it was so long ago. <laughs> and he says, you know, about the relationship with Jock, and I said, well, look, Bill, when uh, Jock Sutherland died, you were only with him one year, and you were all pro. I said, but he, he died at the end of the next year, and he had this brain tumor, and he was losing it even, even then. And I think people were historians look and see that, uh, you know, he just wasn't right. He, which, from everything I hear and I read, he, he wasn't. You know, he was uh, getting into delusions and things like that. You know, and... Uh, and um, the bill, even after all these years, as an old old man, wondered, you know, what, what are people still saying about it? Things know? that you think about even yeah, in yeah, your later years. Exactly. Well, yeah. you go back to it. I do. Th I'm 72, and I go back to that all the time. You know, that, uh, because I had a line doing this or doing that. You know, and, uh, now you, you talk about. Uh, well, how about your other brothers? What do they do? Well, to, um, my dad was, and this is very important because of what's going on now with the Steelers. <clears throat> my father knew two things very, very well, and that was the sporting business, because it was not only football, it was boxing too, you know, and, um, and the, the gambling, the horse racing. And um, as we matured and got older, he realized that he, would, he had five boys being good Catholics, they're going to get married and have big families, and they're going to have to have something to support them. And, um, and so he, you know, had uh, the wherewithal to get a, into the racing business. You know, not just the running of horses and betting on them, but the, uh, you know, the run the racetracks, you know, own the gambling house. And uh, and he, he was able to facilitate things and move it on to, and then he got my, my, uh, Three brothers, Pat, John, and Tim uh, Jobs there. Uh, Tim had stock, started out as a stockbroker. And really, even at this point, you know, right now, you know, it's been maybe five, six years, that he, you know, really has an idea of uh, stocks and financing. And then uh, my brother Pat worked for one of the uh, metal companies, a copper company. And my brother John was a school teacher, track coach. And uh, but when these opportunities came up, you know, at the various racetracks, my father moved them into it, and, um, and they, you know, learned those businesses, and we've all made a living, a nice living, you know, for our, their children, and we all shared in the uh, ownership of the tracks when we got the ownership, and, uh, and but that's that's how my dad did it. He knew those two things and got them into that, you know, and, uh, and uh, they would much rather do that than selling copper or selling stocks and bonds or, sure. you know, teaching English at uh, some high school. Yeah. Now, it, it, you have a part in the book and you talk about uh, the assassination of President Kennedy yeah. and how your father really took that heart. Oh, he sure did. Well, he was an Irish Catholic uh, president, you know, and he, he was acquainted with, uh, he was acquainted with uh, Joe Kennedy, you know, uh, the, the, the father, you know, and... Uh, well, let's face it, he was a rum runner. You know, my dad kind of knew some of those people, you know what I mean? And he, uh, he was acquainted with them. I can't say that he was friends with them or anything. He was acquainted with them. And my father, 
He had a very interesting thing that when uh, Jack Kennedy became the president, uh, got out of the service. You know, he was uh, in terrible physical shape. You know, he had been wounded, and uh, um, the Kennedys were looking for something for him to do. And they, they had always liked sports and football. And, and believe me, in 1945, the, you know, the NFL was not the NFL what it is now. And it wasn't ex expensive for a rich outfit like the Kennedys to buy a franchise. And uh, my, when my father and Burt Bell hired Jock Sutherland, he had been in the Navy <clears throat> to coach the Steelers, they, they had a a press conference in New York, one of the hotels, they had a, a suite, you know, the, the bar was open all day and free lunch, a free lunch. And the newspaper guys all loved that, you know, they all showed up and one of the guys that came to the news conference was uh, a guy just out of the Navy from a very wealthy family, Jack Kennedy. And he, he came to the news conference and hung around and had, you know, beer and sandwiches with all the guys. and and. Um, Later that day, because the thing went all day, he came back and visited again. And, uh, and uh, my dad knew him very slightly, but as a, uh, my, yeah, no, my dad, though, he would meet a guy, a young guy, war hero, like uh, Jack Kennedy, you know, an Irish Catholic type guy. And he, had, my dad had lost his brother, who was killed with the Marines, you know, in the uh, Battle for Guam. And he, he would, remember that, you know, and uh, right take to the guy a lot. And, and uh, so, you know, to continue with the story, when President Kennedy, you know, was assassinated in Dallas, uh, we were playing the Dallas Cowboys all the time, and, uh, and my dad was uh, very, very disturbed about it, and he, he had his own private little protest. The only way he would ever go back to Dallas was a must-need type of thing. You know, like they opened their new stadium, he would go down, or the NFL would have a meeting. But um, if uh, the team was playing there, and we now had TV and television, he would find a reason why he had to be uh, elsewhere. You know, maybe just driving down to his farm or something like that. But he, he never would go to Dallas again unless he had to. So he held a grudge against Dallas. Well, they say one thing about the Irish. They never lose a grudge. <laughs> you know, even, even if they get older, they never. They, they have to have something. They can. They, they hold on to their grudges. Maybe that explains yeah, some so things. He, in my he, family. He, didn't, he didn't dislike uh, Texans or Cowboys. He liked Tex Ram real well, and uh, you know, Mr. Murchison had owned the team, and, uh, and Landry, and you know, ver you know, various people like that. But it just that was his little protest. Yeah. You know. You know, in reading the book, uh, you talk so much about your father and uh, all his achievements. And I, I really enjoyed the fact that he had so many friends. He talked about the fact that he had so many friends. He treated people so well, but it wasn't just the kings and the queens. He treated the common people who were working in service jobs wherever he ran around. Mm -hmm. And I was always taught that as a kid, that you treat everybody the same, it doesn't matter who they are. So when I read that, that really rang true to me and, and the values that I was taught. And, there were, and consequently, there was a lot of affection toward yeah. your father. Now, how did this, and you would see this, and you wrote a lot about this, how did that influence you, watching him, who had a lot going for himself, treating you know, people that were just working stiffs just really giving them great respect. How did that, how did that influence you? And, and did you get along with him? How did you get along with well, him? Well, you use the term there that he always used. He's you know, just a working stiff. You know, that, that was one of his big things to call him a working stiff. And he felt that uh, hey, his father and uh, all their brothers and his mom were, they were the male side, they were all steel workers and uh, ended up in earning bars and that stuff, but they were steel workers. They came over from Wales and Ireland as steel workers, and on the mother's side, they were coal miners. You know, the Murrays were coal miners, and the Rooneys were uh, you know, steel workers, and, uh, uh, and he knew them as people. They were his type of people, you know, and uh, he was never ashamed of them, although he would, you know, with their ways, you know, their uncultured ways, 
he was always like an amazement of them. You know what I mean? He said, you know, uh, you, know you take the boy off the north side, but you can't, can't take the boy, north side off the boy. You know, and uh, he, really, he really liked people and uh, enjoyed being and Everybody had a story and everybody had a, a personality trait that uh, he finds, you know, interesting. It's, uh, he, uh, I, I remember, I may have told you this story before, uh, he was. He always went to funerals, and he was going to a funeral once. And a couple of guys, steel workers, young guys, got corked out in the parkway, you know, uh, and ran the, you know, it was the center line. Then it wasn't a dividing divider, and killed a family. You know, they got killed, and they killed a family, little kids, and then just horrible, horrible people. You know, these two drunken guys, and he was going to their funeral. You know, they're they're awake. And I said, and I never really questioned him much. And they said, well, how could you ever go to their wake with those really just bad guys and what they did? He said, they're young guys. He said, they're working guys. He said, and, uh, he said they, they thought they were pretty smart in that stuff. And he said, but they weren't. And he said, he said, he said and I knew, knew their parents. He said, they're real nice guys. He said, I'm, I'm going to this uh, wake you know, because of these parents. You know, but he really always tried to see good in people. And there, and there are certain people that were bad people, though. You know, and, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, he's a bad person. You know, and when they were bad, they had to be pretty bad. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, real bad, you know. <laughs> you know? And uh, you stay away from those people, you know, just, uh, yeah. So I, I would guess he had a, quite an influence on you. Well, he, he did, and uh, I, I, I hope the good thing, I, well, uh, uh, I saw the you know, former Bishop Worrell, and I didn't know him very well, but he didn't know who I was, by the way, at, at a, some type of banquet, and uh, I was there, my nephew was there, you know, Art Rooney, he has the same name, and Dan's son, and, uh, and somehow, uh, the, the, you know, a little humor, the Bishop said, there's a lot of Art Rooney's around here, he said, I said, yes. There are, and he says, but there's only one original, and he is in heaven. We're all imita imitators, <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. We pretty well are. Yeah. He was the original idea, and uh, I, I don't know. You try to copy things, and uh, I know you can't. He he had a great great penmanship, and I try to copy certain things of it, like his signature, and I can't. Uh, I've, I've sold this book that we're do we've done. Uh, Maybe twenty five hundred, three thousand copies. And I try to sign as many as I can, and and like I say, I always try to get you know, the other beautiful Art Rooney, you know, junior of me. It, it, sign my name two thousand times. It, it even gets worse, <laughs> you, know, my, you know. But he just had a beautiful, and it showed a lot of uh, personal uh, sureness of himself. They, they would say to me, uh, "You're like my fa your father," and I'm really not. He was so sure of himself. He was a, really a great athlete and really a smart guy. But never let anybody know he was smart. He didn't act dumb, but, you know, he was, you know, he would get a lot of people off balance. Yeah. And he, uh, he, he was never a Yun's guy, but he'd always say Yun's. <laughs> you know, he still had the, the Pittsburgh slang, but he worked at not being a Yun's guy. <laughs> yeah. And he worked at the, you know, the, not having the double negatives. And he was exposed to education. I don't know if you're... How many classrooms he went to? He was probably on the playing field all the time, but uh, he, he was not a crude or ignorant type guy. How did you get and, along with him? Not very well at all. You know, and uh, I think I was always jealous of him. You know, and I knew that uh, in my best day I couldn't come close to him. You know, but um, like like in this book, uh, uh, my my brother Dan said that he knew my father much better than I did. You know, he knew the dad much better. And, and, uh, and Tim too, yeah, they did. They were, and I, I don't even. I, that doesn't hurt me or anything. The only thing is, I listened to everything he said, and I watched him, you know. And uh, these stories, uh, Dan did write a book, and it's quite much more su successful than mine. But um, I understand that he doesn't have the stories that I had, you know, and. Uh, and my brother Tim says to me a lot of times, he'll read your story, and I'll say, well, that's not exactly the way that happened. He says, yeah, you're close, but not exactly. I said, well, look, I said, you, you, not even hard feelings, because I was always just trying to get these stories preserved and out there. He says, why didn't you write them down? 
You know, I said, in fact, next time we have a book signing, I said, uh, you can go with me or go for me and you just tell the stories because I know that you... And the, and the other interesting thing about that is that if you ever get Dan to tell a story, you know, he's not much for telling stories. And he knows them all and, you know, probably better date tell than me. Or Tim, or even the twins, Pat and John. There's always a little nuance that's a little bit different. It's a basically the same story, but a little different. But in the telling, it, it's the same story, but it's a different thing. It's like a piece of music, you know, the same, same tune, but just a little theme and variation on it, you know. But again, you asked how I, I, uh, I, I thoroughly admired him, you know, but uh, I was never a pal of his, yeah. you know. And, uh, he, he, was, he was always didactic. He was always teaching, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, you're kind of a proud guy. I spent more time with my mother. And people were saying to me, boy, you look like your father. And I said, I said, I'd rather look like my mother. I said, she was prettier and a lot nicer than him. <laughs> you know, a real lot nicer than him. Yeah. Well, it, it, speaking of your mother, uh, talk about your mother. Uh, you, you talk about your mother in the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was her influence on the family? Well, she was with us all the time. And, and she certainly loved my dad, and uh, she'd call him an old bastard now and then. And uh, But then you'd, you'd say something, and I remember one time uh, she said to me, uh, you know, you take all five of you guys and put you in a bag and shake it up, and you still couldn't make a patch on your old man's <laughs> <laughs> but, You know, there are certain limitations. You know, she, and she could be the one that would complain. He would never, ever say any type of swear word. And, uh, and she and her sister lived with her. You live with us. They they could they could swear. They they they, they weren't always out swearing and that stuff. But boy, they could really swear good. You know, and uh, at home, maybe not at home too. You know, but uh, <laughs> but uh, they weren't afraid to say something. And uh, they had some spunk. And they're they're um, they would pray the actually in reality pray the pages off of prayer books. Go to mass and communion every day. Make all the novenas. And uh, pray the rosary, and boy, don't don't cross them wrong because they they would let you have it. You know? <laughs> and especially the boys, you know, there are five boys, six boys, counting the chief. You know, uh, you know that was her main thing in life. You know, my mother one time was with my wife, and they were some fancy thing, and my and the girls, my wife and uh, my mom, somehow came up. They're the most modest women. You know, the Catholic stuff really worked with them. Most modest women you'd ever seen in your life, and they, they had um, dresses. And my wife told me this story that were kind of low cut. My mom was trying to pull it up, you know, cover up her cleavage and that stuff. And, and she looked in the mirror and told my wife, she says, Kay, I look like a. <laughs> you know? And my wife just, you know, anything but that, you know, it, it, they didn't, you know, it just showed a little of what they had. My wife thought that was the funniest thing in the world for her to say that. You know, <laughs> that they, boy, was she a modest woman. And a very, very well-dressed and a very, uh, you know, could wear clothes. She was taller than my dad. She would never wear high heels, you know, because she wore the lower one so she didn't embarrass him by being too tall for him, you know. But, uh, and she, she would have had stories. She, she said, we went on our honeymoon to New York, and she says, and they picked us up. They, my dad's friends, a guy named Duffy, who worked for a guy named... Uh, uh, what was that guy's name? But, but anyway, Madden. Madden, he was a bad one. You know. But my dad wouldn't say that, but he was a, they said he had more notches on his gun than Billy the Kid. But they picked him up at the train station, and my wife got in this car, and she said it was the fanciest car you ever want to get into, but the, the, the windows were very, very, very thick, and there was little holes in the side. And uh, she says, Art, uh, what are these little holes in the side of the car here for? You know, it's not, just don't say anything about it, don't say anything about it. And the guy that was my dad's friend that, that picked him up said, Kathleen, they were for sticking the guns out the window. <laughs> you know, they were, uh, you know, what do you call them, brazier? <laughs> There's a word for that. You know, you can shoot out the window. She says, you never seen anything like that in her life. And, uh, and uh, the, the guy, they owned a cotton club. Do you ever see that movie, The Cotton Club? Yeah. And I read it that one time. Showed it to my dad. He knew all of it. He knew all the things. He knew everything about it. And he wasn't that interested. He watched it and that stuff. But he knew all the cast of characters. And uh, he says, "Well, you know," he says, I, "I really wasn't that friendly with them." He said, "I, I knew." He said, "I knew uh, Madden's brother and I knew Duffy and that." And he said, "But I, 
you know, I wasn't in with those guys. Okay, we said something. Well, your, your, your wife uh, became quite close with your mother. Oh, yeah, because, see, my mother never did not have a daughter, and John, Pat, and Tim lived out of town. You know, and she was, they looked enough like the people would think that that was her daughter, you mm. know, and they spoke the same language. How did this go? Now, one time my wife was very upset. I was always on the road, and we had a handicapped kid and that stuff. And my wife went over to visit them over on the north side, 940 North Lincoln. They lived in a little, little mansion, you know, uh, over there in Lincoln Avenue. And Dan still lives there. And uh, my wife went up to rang the doorbell, and she was crying. And my Aunt Alice, you know, the mom's sister, answered the door, and she says, What's wrong? And she, my wife just couldn't talk. She was crying. And uh, my mom came out and she said, uh, Kay, I don't know what you're crying about, but you came to the right place. So all three of them just cried and cried and cried. But they, they really had a great, great relationship. Wow. That's and, really uh, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Now, uh, you, your father, as a as a young owner in the National Football League, uh, he had a lot of lean years early on, uh, to yeah, say he, the least. Yeah, he kept the team going, uh, you know, with his gambling winnings. And, yeah, uh, they they put fights on. You know, the boxing was big in Pittsburgh. Yeah, my grandfather talks about that all the time. Yeah, they they uh, made more money on the boxing. Yeah, than they did, and, uh, now he, he got criticized a, a lot. You know, in those early mm -hmm. years by the press. And even, you know, uh, any owner is going to get criticized, yeah. even upon some success. Yeah. How did he handle the criticism? Well, he had a great sense of humor. And he was, he was really friendly with the newspaper guys, you know, the writers. And, uh, and he never held it against them. I, I remember one time, uh, is either Livingston or Jack Sell, who was a teammate of his, he had played semi-pro baseball together, wrote something, and I thought, gee, we'll never talk to him again. Uh, and uh, here, they're hanging out together. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I did, these are things that I did not understand. You know, how somebody could publicly go after you and you know, that stuff, and, uh, you know, about the team being bad, and, uh, and uh, but, they, you know, they weren't vicious, though. You know what I mean? And, uh, but uh, my, my mom never read the sports pages. And I said, well, why don't you read the sports pages? She said, oh, she said, I'm just so fond of uh, Pat Livingston and Jack Sell. She says, nah, my friendship is more valuable than reading what they had to say. She said, well, they wrote something I didn't like. She said, I just like those guys too well to do that. Yeah. But my dad had a way, and he realized they were trying to make a living. You know, and, uh, I was thinking of something this morning about you know people trying to make a living. And we lived around Lincoln Avenue, and there was a Millionaire's Row there, and they had these huge houses that were just unbelievably beautiful, you know, ballrooms in them, and, and uh, they went into complete disrepair, you know, all the rich people moved to uh, Swickley or out to Oakland, and then Ligonier and then out of town, you know, just, you know, you know, the years went by, and, and um, across the street from our house, this old mansion, uh, they had rooms, and and uh, we got to the point where we were like 16 to 18 years old, you know, late in, you know, in high school, freshman in college, and here some gals moved into uh, one of the downstairs apartments in one of these places, and they had the prettiest girls, about three girls living in this place, you know, but they never went to work, they were always in there, you know. And uh, you would talk to him, visit with him a little bit. And all of a sudden, I didn't know. I was the most innocent guy going. All of a sudden, my aunt, who lived with us, Aunt Alice, she got my dad and she says, Arthur, she says, you know, that, that place over there is nothing but a horse. And she said, uh, and they, these, these boys, I see the boys talking to those girls and that stuff. And I do kind of remember they're real, 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 real pretty girls, you know. He says, and, uh, and you, know, you know, it's going to be nothing but trouble with these boys. And my dad evidently didn't catch on to it at first, you know, with the, these girls across the street. And it was like that evening that he had made a phone call. They were all gone. 
gone forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, and he said, yeah, and I heard, I heard him say uh, years later, he says, well, you know, you have to make a living. I hate to ruin somebody's business, but I don't want to run their business around my son. <laughs> my <laughs> backyard, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, we're across the street from us. But, that's, uh, a fu- that's a funny story. Yeah. Now, talking about that, uh, the Steelers, the, the, uh, it seemed the, su- the Super Steelers started really in the late 60s, the, the, the genesis of that, and, and I think one of the first big parts of that was the hiring of a coach in the late yeah, well, 60s. Yeah. Now, you, got, you were not invited to the interview, but talk about who the candidates were for that job yeah, well, and how that all went down. My brother Dan, you know, when I was in college, he went to Duquesne. He used to work for the team, and, and he... Uh, you know, they didn't have any real scouting department. The guy was our personnel director, was a local uh, mortician, you know, Ray Byrne. We used to call him Digger Burns. And he, he just loved scouting, you know, organizing information on the Steelers and things like that. And, I mean, on the college players for the Steelers. Well, they paid him off in the dark, I don't know. <laughs> for, I shouldn't put it that way, but uh, because he's a mortician. But... Uh, they gave him a few hundred bucks, you know, and uh, he really had good records and that stuff. And Dan helped out there, you know, and, and uh, he got to be friends with uh, some college coaches would come through town and that stuff. And, and one of the guys was Paterno. Paterno was an assistant coach at Penn State and got to be you know, really a nice acquaintance with my brother Dan. And, and so uh, Joe by that time was doing v- real well. And, and uh, we had made a couple mistakes. Uh, we brought Bill Austin in that. Parker was my dad's friend. And uh, we brought uh, Bill Austin in on the advice of uh, Lombardi, who loved my father. You know. But they just recommended the wrong guy. You know, and, because Austin had been a real top assistant coach, but was just not a head coach. You know, that, those things go. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Dan and I, you know, talked about, you know, who were good coaches and that stuff. And you had to get a good coach. And we were going to go to Three River Stadium in a few years and things like that. And there's no name for Three River Stadium at that time, just the new stadium. And uh, and my job was a very informal one, just ask questions on the road. You know, who, who would be uh, a good coach? Of course, Paterno was the first guy that uh, they wanted Davey and my dad and Dan. And uh, anywhere I went would ask my coaches, you know, mainly the uh, Scots and that stuff. A couple of names always came up. One was Chuck Knoll, another was Chuck Knox. And two, you know, Knox became a real good coach. He was a Pittsburgh guy, too, but he's never a Chuck Knoll. But uh, he, he never had anything to be ashamed with Chuck Knox. He was you know, a good coach. But, but when uh, Dan, and I don't know if my dad ever met with him with Dan, but I know Dan met with Paterno, and he, you know, like, throughout his whole career, he was a Penn State guy, you know, and he really wasn't going to leave. And uh, so they start interviewing, uh, you know, pro guys, and, of course, uh, Noel's name kept on popping up everywhere. And uh, Shula had told my dad about he had a real hot shot assistant coach. And the two guys that worked for the uh, Colts were Bert Bell, who had been my dad's partner, his, Bert's sons, uh, Bert Jr. and Upton, and they kept on, you know, they had just a direct line to us, you know, just, you know, nothing formal, you know, just, and they kept on saying, we have the greatest assistant coach here in uh, football, you know, Chuck Knoll. And so uh, I was out on the road and I came back in, and um, and I think it was either Fran Fogarty or Ed Kiley, you know, worked with the stewards. Said, hey, your your dad and Dan are in the Sylvan room. That was the Roosevelt Hotel. That was the main dining room. Interviewing Chuck Knoll, and so I I just went in on my own. And I sat down with them, and um, there's nothing wrong with that. They were just having coffee. You know what I mean? Uh, and um, but I started to ask questions, and I was not in. You know, I was not invited. I muscled my way in to the interview. And uh, you know, ask questions about uh, you know players, and then I got into the thing on the racial thing. Yeah, well, that was very important to you. Talk about that. Well, because I had started to scout these black schools, and uh, 
and the athletes there, you know, just see them in the dressing room. I mean, they, they, we don't have guys in our dressing room like that. Yeah, you know I mean, you know, now and then you have a guy that's cut that way and built that way. And, um, you know, and they had the great athletic talent and, and, you know, just seeing them play and the big plays they'd make and that stuff. They all seemed to be pretty nice kids, too. And the coaches were nice guys. And the only thing they always wanted, they just would say, just give us a chance. Give us a chance. All we want is a chance. Just give us the opportunity, you know. And so I, I got in on this interview and um, they start to ask, you know, Noel what uh, he thought of the black athlete. He said, I, I don't give a darn what, uh, you know, race anybody is. He said, the only thing I want are, you know, the great a athletes that I can, I can coach. And they have to be pretty decent guys. I'm not looking for choir boys, but pretty decent guys that they're going to have team goals and that. And, now, that's not exactly how it was said, but that's the way I can remember it, yeah. And, um, and then I asked him about the scouting and that stuff, you know, about the scouting groups and that, because we had to have something like Blesto, because we couldn't afford to have a big scouting thing. We had to have that. And, and uh, he, he said that, that was okay, but he wanted his own coaches involved, and I wasn't too happy with that. And uh, because they, I always thought that they would disrupt all the information you had. They, you got five looks at the guy, and maybe the assistant coach had one. But there's a hierarchy. The assistant coach was going to have more to say. You know. So, so anyways, uh, I start getting these uh, side glances from my dad and Dan, like, keep your mouth shut. And uh, I'd be exaggerating, but not by much, that I start to get kicked under the table. You know. Uh, in fact, as the years go on, I'm starting to say I get kicked under the table. But I'm still at the point I didn't get kicked under the table. But I knew that they were pissed. You know, that... Uh, you know, I was uh, I was taking I was interrupting her parade. I was marching yeah. in their parade, and uh, and so when Noel left, uh, you know, go to his room, and my dad said, "Look," he said, uh, he said, uh, you know, "I've been around here for a long time," because I had said I wanted to be in charge of the draft. I mean, you know, the actual drafting. He said, he said, you you're in charge of the gathering of the information, the organizing, and you know, and things like that. He said, but you, I have to have the head coach, you know, be in that, re have that responsibility. He said, because if he gets fired, you don't want to be the one to get fired. You know what I mean? You know, and, and, you know you, the family owns the team, and I can't, you know, I have to have the, the coach can't be saying that, uh, you know, we didn't allow him to pick the players and that. And so that's, hey, that's the only job I had, and I liked it. That's where it was, but um, uh, you know, like so many things at this stage of the game, I'd like to take responsibility for. You know, like the invention of Blesto, uh, uh, and I didn't, you know, invent it. Uh, and like bringing Chuck Noll in, I'd love to say, well, I went into this meeting and I was the main reason they got him, or I set everybody straight. And that, that was that's a, that's a pretty nice little story, you know. I mean, but. You know, it was pretty, that was Dan's show, you know, and my dad gave the okay on it and put me in my place, you know what I mean? But at least I was part of it. But, I mean, believe me, Lee, that's kind of a big thing, you know, the, be part of, uh, you know, interviewing Chuck Noll. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You, know, you had to elbow your way into it. Yeah. And, uh, and as I've always said that, uh, you know, I'm a vice president of the stewards now and on the board and they, uh, you know, but own, I own as much as, thanks to my dad as Dan does. But um, there's a lot more fun when you had responsibility and you were dealing with a Chuck Knoll or a Bill Austin, you know, and, uh, you know, you were really part of it. Yeah, you, you were just in the not trenches. some executive type of job, you know. So you hired Chuck <laughs> Knoll, and, and I guess then that, uh, you know, you started to work with him fairly quickly. Now, that was right before, what, he, the 69 draft? Yeah, he right? came in 69, right before the draft. In fact, it was the night before the draft. The night before the, the draft, you hired him. We had all our draft boards up in the, the Roosevelt Hotel, we had it up, and and everything was organized, and he came in from uh, the Colts, and uh, and uh, you know, and he, I got real lucky. We got real lucky. We went over our draft board, and he he never brought anything with him. You know, he had a lot of integrity. I mean, really, you know, Noel was a very, a, you know, very top guy. He was a person. Uh, and he didn't bring any secret notes with him or that. But he knew, and he was a real smart guy, how they had guys rated. And uh, here we got lucky. 
both of us, Noel and the Steelers, we had guys rated very similar than the Colts did. And one of the guys was Joe Green. And the real luck was when Joe Green was there when we drafted because we both agreed that that was the guy we wanted. So we did not have that problem of, you know, my wanting somebody and Noel wanted somebody. You know, we both wanted, uh, you know, we both wanted uh, Joe Green. And, uh, that was and the start of the Super Steelers. I, I, I think Chuck uh, Noll and Joe Green. Yeah, that's right. And I think um, in 69, 70, 71, 2, 3, and 4, six years, we may have had uh, a run, maybe, a run of the best six years in the history of football. Yeah. Maybe. And we're going to talk about some of those drafts yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. But now, it, it, you worked with him, and, and, and you got Joe Green in that first year. Um, <clears throat> what did he tell you? What, what did he tell you he wanted in his players? He, he, wanted, he wanted great athletes. You, know, you, you can't make a great player out of uh, you know, somebody just doesn't have that kind of talent. And he told me, he said, you, you haven't been around a group of great players. The, things that you, the thing that you have to do is go to the All-Star game, which is now the Pro Bowl. Just spend a week there and see these guys. Go in the dressing room and see how they're built. Uh, you know, you know, talk to them and that stuff. And that was a great suggestion for me. Although that game was kind of around the time of the draft, so you take away from the draft and that. But I think that was an expensive kind of trip out to Los Angeles or later Hawaii. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, uh, no, I, I was incensed. I, I, I've been around football players all my life. You know, you know to tell this guy that. Tell me how to identify a player, but he was right. You know, you know, I, I was pretty good. I mean, as far as knowing what a good athlete looked like and moved like, but um, yeah, that that's something that I probably should have been doing all along. Yeah, you know, but we were so short-handed. I was spending all my time, you know, working on the draft itself. Yeah, you know. but um, he he insisted on the, the great athlete who was coachable. You know, he had some football intelligence at least. And um, yeah, not not a bad act, actor, you know. Uh, he was, as, as he said, he wasn't known for choir boys or anything like that. But you know, somebody whose uh, team goals were a little bit more important than personal goals. You know? Now you were in kind of an interesting position because now you're working with Chuck Knoll, but you had been working with Jack Butler, mm -hmm. and both of them had a little different twist on what they would look for. For example, mm -hmm. you said Chuck Knoll wanted the athleticism. Mm -hmm. The intelligence mm. and some character, yeah. but Jack Butler, the head of Blesto, mm. said he wanted toughness and production you know, Chuck, and Chuck NFL even, athletic Chuck, Chuck, Chuck uh, certainly <clears throat> agreed with toughness, but you know Jack was very, very much on toughness and production. Production. Could they and did they play the game? And Chuck's thing is that well, he went to see the guys who were making a real top effort, but he felt that he could teach you know, certain things and. And, uh, and Jack, uh, he, he liked a good athlete, but he, he just wanted the guy to have, to have enough talent that he didn't leave, you know, when he got to the next level, you know, could not go to the next level. Because there are guys like that. You know, they, they can be real good uh, high school players and they're just okay. Uh, everyone thinks they're going to be a Division I, uh, you know, uh, football player. and. They really should be playing at, uh, you know, another type school, not the University of Michigan. Yeah. So in the pros too, you know, some guys uh, are real good college players, but uh, they get to the pros. They just, uh, especially the thing that really would kill those kind of guys. And you came in and you had a lot of these black kids from uh, Alcorn A and M, you know, and uh, Florida A and M, and they'd get there and uh, who's this guy? You know, I was uh, all American at uh, University of Pittsburgh. And all of a sudden, uh, after the, the the black kids, especially he got himself some good coaching and time to develop, uh, you know, he came from nowhere. You know, and he is really good. Yeah. You know, and, and he, whereas the other guy has reached his potential in college. You know. Now, the, being in that conversation, I'm sure, and I know in football, and not just football, but a lot of sports, but especially in football, they talk about heart. And what did the people around you, what did they say to you about heart? They, they would have a lot of uh, little, um, 
those little cliches were funny as heck. You know, uh, that, uh, well, he, he's the kind of guy that you'd like to have for your son-in-law. You know, you know, a good player, gave it all, smart kid, very respectful and that stuff. You know, you know, and uh, then another guy said, "Well, if you'd, if you'd have him, have him home, you'd, you'd uh, put your daughters in the other room, you know, and hide them from him." He said, but, "But you went out in that field, you went out, and, you know, into the war. He was a guy you wanted to have playing, uh, you know, the defensive end for you, you know, and uh, you know, and uh, but uh, but like Rocky Blair, he had uh, all heart, and he came." To us, he was a captain at Notre Dame, and uh, he, he came to us and uh, he, he gained some weight. I remember we had a guy named Tom Don Heinrich, who's an assistant under uh, Austin, who was a great personnel guy, but you know he was, that was not his main job. But he went up to take a look at uh, Rocky, and uh, he said, you know, his background, you know, he's a top high school player. He was the captain at Notre Dame, you know. He says, but he says he's too small and too slow. He says maybe maybe he'll gain ten pounds. And he ran a four eight forty, which is very marginal, and he won't lose that at least a four eight, and he'll be able to cover some kicks for us. And maybe make uh, you know play a few plays of the position. And he came in and he did exactly that. You know he covered the heck out of the special teams, and uh, gained about ten twelve pounds and could still run a four eight forty. Of course, everybody knows that story of Rocky. I mean, he is Mr. Hart, you know, all Hart. Well, actually, I want to I want to talk about that a little yeah, bit yeah. down the road. I want to talk yeah. about that, but mm -hmm. before that, I, I want to ask you a couple other things. Um, one of the things about drafting, and we hear this, and, and the Steeler draft, it's become an event in Pittsburgh yeah, at this point. It. Really, yeah, a yeah, real yeah. event. I mean, it is I just so sort of covered. My head. Yeah, I mean, it is so covered. It's yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. And these are kids that you know have never walked on a pro field mm -hmm. yet, but yet. It's really become such a big deal because the Steelers are a big deal. Yeah. But one one of the debates always is: Do you draft for the position that you need, or do you draft the best athlete available? And what was yeah. your Jack Butler's and Chuck Knowles? Well, I, spin on I, that? I felt that, uh, of course, most of my stuff I got from guys like Jack Butler. Yeah, you know I mean, that our team needed so many positions that. We didn't have that problem of, you know, you, you might say, well, we need an offensive tackle, and you would take a tackle. But I've learned to look at it. It was a, it, kind of an innovation I got from a couple of the good teams like the Rams and Dallas that um, you go for the best athlete, you know, the best guy that can make the big plays and the big games and consistently. You go for those kind of guys regardless of position especially on a team that's so lousy because you can't, uh, no matter what you get, you don't, you don't have that much talent. You know what I mean? That, uh, well, we don't need a tackle. Like hell, you don't need a tackle. You know, it's this team here. And, and so you, you would, uh, if, if the tackle was the best guy available, you took the tackle. I, I was very happy with the Steelers this year on their second pick. It looked to me that they really did that because um, you've gotten so much now into the position pick, you know to take the uh, a wide receiver, you know, that uh, evidently was the best player left, you know, in, on the board, you know, regardless of position. But that, that was a very important innovation for us that um, you, you uh, like you rated the players by position, you know, offensive tackle, defensive, t or offensive guard, offensive center, defensive end, defensive tackle, and um, you know, inside backer, outside backer, safety man, defensive corner, and um, but then you came up with another list of regardless of position, who are the best. You know, and so uh, then you would start comparing. You know, well, look at what rating we have on this uh, offensive tackle. Um, he's just a guy who can make it and come in and play for you. But look at the rating we have on this uh, defensive back. You know, uh, he's a guy we have rated could be a star. So you, know, you try to get all the guys could be the stars. You know, and all the guys can start. You see, you know, and you come up with the, the top hundred players, regardless of position. 
And at the end of the day, how many guys did you have off that 100 list? Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, that was the important thing. Now, with yeah. Joe Green, was he rated the number one guy on your list? He was rated, I think, sixth. Sixth. Yeah. I think he was drafted eighth, and I think he was sixth. He was rated And sixth. that's where we got so lucky that Chuck had, you know, pretty well rated the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Chuck Knowles' first year uh, wasn't a successful year as far as his record, but there's two players I want you to talk about in particular that uh, you write about yeah. in the book. and. The first is Dick Hoke and then Roy Jefferson. Well, the interesting thing about Hoke was, you're talking about heart and intelligence. And a real good athlete, but not a great athlete. And Noel would always use him as an example. He says, well, you know, he's, a, he's just a journeyman type football player. Well, Dick was a little bit better than that, you know. And uh, but he, he, he could throw the pass. Uh, he was like a poor man's Paul Horning. You know what I mean? <laughs> but he wasn't that much of a poor man. Right. And uh, it was funny when when uh, the Scots would uh, come. In, the bus of the Scots would come into the meetings and say, "Well, uh, th this guy here, he's he's better than that Hoke guy Pittsburgh has." And then as the years went by, uh, the tone of voice changed. They'd say, "Well, uh, hey, this guy's a pretty good player. He." He'll be, uh, he could develop to be a player like Hoke, you know. So, you know, Dick then by his retired, but by reputation, had, you know, moved up. And finally they came in, and I thought it was the greatest tribute to Dick. He said, uh, he's a good player, he's helped your team run special teams and that stuff. He said, but he'll never be as good as Hoke. You know, you know and he, he was and through playing, but as an example, you know, the comparison, he had moved up from a guy, well, better than, might be as good as, uh, no, he won't be as good as Dick Hoke, you know, and, and uh, I, I hope that uh, Chuck changed his attitude. I, I know he changed his, he didn't change his attitude, he developed, developed a great uh, um, devotion to Dick Hoke as a, a, a coach. I think Dick Hoke was with us longer than, uh, I've been married, something like 49 years or something like that, you know. And not the biggest. One of our, one of our heroes, Joe. Yeah. yeah, not yeah. the biggest, not the fastest, no, but uh, had the heart uh, and became uh, part of the steel yeah, vernacular. He, had, he, had, he was a good athlete and a very, very smart football player. And uh, like a hundred, you'd call it heart, you know, 110 percenter, you know, and, uh, you know, play hurt. Uh, you know, all the cliches, you can say play hurt, play hurt. Uh, He's all hard, you know, and, uh, you know, Rocky Blower was a similar guy. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, Roy Jefferson was a whole different story. Yeah, and, and Roy, Roy was a great, great, great gifted athlete. And, um, uh, he, and it really was like our Pro Bowl player. He was our second pick, which was our first pick. We didn't have a first pick with Buddy Parker. But um, it was productive for us. It was a very temperamental guy and uh, very self-righteous and things like that. And, uh, and he had a reputation for being a tester. You know, the, the very interesting thing about Roy, I was pretty tough with him in the book, and I, and I believe what I wrote, but he showed up for, we honored like the, some of the great prayers from our past, and he was so thrilled even to be invited back to Pittsburgh and to be considered one of the great old players, and he, and he was still married to the same gal, I think her name's Candy or something like that, and his son with him, and uh, was just a delightful guy to be around. And and I, I thought to myself, and Roy McHugh, you know, who, who helped me so much on this book, and I and, and Roy was kind of taken with him too, and I said, holy heck, yeah, maybe we should go back and change our book. And I said, no, <laughs> we, we can't do that because in the time frame we wrote, you know, that, that was true. Now, if we had met him before, we could say, uh, you know, this guy was a, pretty much of a horse's ass as a stealer, but, you know, turned him to be a real fine uh, gentleman, you know, a civilized yeah. gentleman. But uh, we didn't have, have that uh, information. Well, people grow up. You know? Well, you know, you, you forget that these guys are uh, 22 to 28 right. to 32 years old. Absolutely. And Roy left us and went to uh, continue to make the Pro Bowl, you know, and... Uh, and um, played on two, two, more, two Super Bowl teams, you know, one with the uh, Colts and one with the Redskins, I guess. It was. Well, and plus some of these guys with this great talent were yeah. so catered to at yeah. a young age. Oh, no yeah. doubt about it, from the time they were in junior high school. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. 
Now, the first year with Chuck Knoll, as I say, wasn't so successful. You were 1 in 13, but then you, you were involved in a coin flip that ended up being one of the most important, or important yeah. coin flips in Steeler history. Really, it was uh, the Bears and the Steelers, and uh, Ed McCaskey flipped the coin for the Bears and Dan for the Steelers. I was back working on the draft, you know, and, uh, and uh, you got the rights to the first pick. Now, we didn't say, well, we got the rights to the first pick, we're taking Bradshaw, because that was just a little bit later. You know, we then had the pick, you know, and that was a whole different story, you know, what, what to do with that pick. You know, and, uh, you know, either take, trade it, that was a big thing. You, you go out and you get a slew of players, and any time that Dan and I uh, had ever seen that, you, you know, it, it basically didn't work out. I remember, uh, it was the Cardinals that traded to, for Oli Matson and got like 10 players or something, and they got a couple of good players, but Matson continued on being a Hall of Famer, and the guys they brought in, you know, they were still on the same team. You know, they didn't win that much. And, uh, and I think um, another team, and I can't remember who it was in the real old days, had traded for, you know, one player, and, uh, and it didn't work. The player they brought in didn't work out. The players they sent, you know, so, you know to the other team. I think Herschel Walker was one. Well, of that those. was that was much much later. Later, Herschel Walker. Yeah. But I mean, it, it either didn't work out for the team that was getting the one player. It, it worked out for them maybe great, or the team that sent the players didn't. You know, it it, it, it never was an even deal, and uh, and yeah, you know, I was just so sold on uh, building the team through the draft with young players. That all the talk about trading them. And Noel told me years and years later, he said, you know, we had to do that. Make those trades, him and those calls and that stuff. Because, you know, you had a fiduciary duty to your team and maybe it was a, going to be the right thing to do. And I just looked at that and I just was not sold on it. And, and you, know, you could not, and my dad was still the boss. You know what I mean? And, um, we watched some movies with us and that stuff, and uh, he he kind of was listening to Noel, and uh, I don't know how thoroughly Dan was involved with that, but he was involved. But I mean, I don't know to this day if he wanted to really trade the rights to Bradshaw or uh, keep them, and uh, I just can't remember. But uh, well, before we get to Bradshaw, yeah, I just want to ask yeah. you this. Uh, you know, you, you talked about uh, barging in on that interview and asking Chuck Knoll about uh, what he thought about black players and, mm -hmm. and or was he okay to bring in black players because the NFL was pretty yeah. racist he, prior to that. Oh, there's no doubt. And, and, and he, but he would have made uh, Dr. King and I don't know the other black leaders, you know, we all know about Dr. King, very, very proud and happy that uh, a guy getting in this authority didn't give it. But the color yeah, of your what skin. What color they were, or what the religion was, or anything. He just went good, top athletes who were coachable. And boy, he, he made that clear to my dad and Dan. Of course, he was, that was music to my ears. Yeah, that's, that's what, what you to wanted to hear. Yeah, and now on other things I asked, it wasn't music to my ears, but that was the main thing. That was the main and thing then you he, wanted. And he was looking back at that. Uh, well, you'd have to be very proud that uh, you know, a guy would come up... Uh, with that and say that. You know, no, no ifs, ands, or buts, and this and that, but hey, look, that is the last thing that I'll ever to tolerate. You know, I went to great players, I don't care what they are. What know? seemed like it played a pretty significant role, that attitude, and the, really the rise of the Super Steelers. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that, how important that was, because uh, we, we just uh, came up with an awful lot of black players who were young guys, and maybe not from the top schools or the big schools, that needed special coaching. And he, he got good coaches, and he was a, co he was a teacher. And uh, he, he was, had the theories and the, and the strategies, but 
He basically was a coach in a t-shirt. But your father, I think, was also ahead of his time when it came to racial attitudes because he really, really was brought up with mm. racism and prejudice, yet he told you that if a black player was good enough, he'd move out of his no, master no, bedroom no, yeah, and move I'm into sure. the house. Yeah, another bedroom. My mom, he, mom and him would move uh, another part of the house. And uh, Not a lot of people uh, thought that no, way back then. But, but he, my father was a very fair person, more, more than uh, the racial thing. It was... You know, everybody's a human being, and it's just being fair. You know, that, you know they deserve fairness. And uh... now, now you, you you did a lot of traveling as a scout, and you would travel the South, obviously, quite a bit. Yeah, I you went would to see the lot of black schools. Yeah, and you went to the black schools, and and you were you saw the Confederate flag down there, and you mm -hmm. saw some of the attitudes down there. I mean, when you went and saw some of that, what were your thoughts coming from the background? I sort of shook, shook my head and I said, holy heck, I, I, I thought this all ended. You know what yeah. I mean? And I, I went <laughs> to one school and, uh, and uh, they had a great little receiver. And it was really in the south. And uh, boy, the coach was on this guy with racial stuff. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you little, you know what? And, you know, come on, you can't dog it and that stuff. And boy, and... He he was on this guy, and I was holy heck, you know, you know this, you can't be like that, you know. And, uh, and it was very funny. Like two years later, I looked, and the guy was in another school up north, you know. And he he couldn't take it either. And then I went to a school with, um, it was really one of the schools, you know. I think maybe their name was the Rebels. I don't know, but um, they were playing someone like Houston University. Houston, the top player at Houston, was a black kid. And they had their kids in blackface. You know, I can see putting jerseys on the, uh, you know, you let the player have the same build, try to get somebody the same build and speed with the, uh, and wear his jersey number. You know what I mean? I'm talking about in practice, you know. They had these guys in blackface. They're all white, and they had them in blackface. And I thought, man, way hot. You know what I mean? And it wasn't because I hated the coaches. They were, they were pretty nice guys. They gave me access and talked to me. And all maybe one of them had played for the Steelers or played for another NFL team. And I said, man, a life. They get away with this stuff. Yeah, you know, gee, man, he's amazing. It was. But, but uh, that, that all changed, you know. I mean, that, what sports did for that, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I think sports helped yeah, that. But, you uh, know, it's funny. I lived in Atlanta in the 80s. Yeah. and people would still be talking about this civil war. They'd mm. say northerners that come down to mm. live here mm. with us, we call them, or northerners that come down to visit us, mm. we call them Yankees. Mm. Northerners that come down and live here, we call them damn Yankees. Mm. And I was thinking to myself, this is the 80s. Mm. I mean, it, yeah. it just amazed I, me. I went, uh, we, we had, you know, Noel was with us, and we had the new stadium in Atlanta. And, and uh, I, I got, Picked up at the airport and I told the guy in my suitcase with me, you know, uh, and take me to the Atlanta Stadium. You know, we were playing that night. I guess it was preseason. And uh, we were talking to the cab driver. He's a real nice guy. And, and he says, "What do you do?" I said, "I'm a scout." He said, I'm a "Scout?" I said, "Yeah, for the Steelers." I said, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. You, you, you know, I get it. You know, you're playing there tonight. That's where you're going. I said, yeah. And uh, he said, "Yeah, I mean Georgia boys." And I said, yeah, we have, you know, like, uh, Bobby Walden and someone else. And I said, we've got some black guys. Uh, do, you, do you count black guys? And the guy, the cab driver, came up with the greatest thing. He said, only the third good. You know, so, I mean, it showed that if they were good, he would accept them. Yeah, I mean, uh, and so I looked at that as well. Maybe he's made, a, he's come off center. You know I mean? He's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's moving, he's a moving up a little bit there. But... Uh, Oh, I, I could go on and on about that racial stuff, especially in the South. And the, the thing that got you was that, uh, you know, the guys, the coaches were nice to you and pretty nice guys, nice guys to visit with. They had that one thing. You know, they were, they were racist. Well, that's how they were but, taught. You know, well, whatever it was. And I mean, I thought, gee, man, he's, you know, how can nice people like this be so racial? And I thought, they're, they're, but they're going to be the losers because you can't win. And the guy that saw that was Bear Bryant. He saw that you know he could not compete against you know and they got these big bowl games against Southern Cal and those schools. He had to have the black athletes and and, uh, and once you have them, you'll find out that uh, the vast majority are pretty darn good guys. 
you know, you have some stinkers, but you got a lot of stinkers of the white guys too. But they're they're pretty nice guys, and they have a lot, a lot of fun to be. And probably some are a hell of a lot more fun to be with than the, the white guys, you know, because they have a great sense of humor in that. And uh, but that, I mean, that was a real real lesson for me, you know, that uh, you, you try to be taught to be fair in that stuff. And uh, well, your father that came from yeah, your father. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, now, well, going back to that draft, you, you had the first pick in the draft. You had some discussions as to whether to trade it, whether to keep it. You guys decided to keep the pick and take the pick. But now you're out, out on scouting missions looking for who is going to be this number yeah. one pick. Talk about your visit to go look at Terry Bradshaw. Yeah, now Louisiana Tech and uh, Ruston, Louisiana. That's, that's the name of that town. I, kind of try, I was trying to think of that the other night, and I forgot the name of that town. Because Ruston was right here, and Grandma was right there. You know, Grandma was a great black school. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, we, we had information on Bradshaw for a number of years, you know, uh, you know, had an arm like a cannon, but couldn't spell a cat, you know, and uh, that's right in the scouting report, and, uh, but uh, I think old Bradshaw always he went to make you think he couldn't spell a cat, and, but he's probably smart enough, but uh, I, w I went out and uh, he's, he came out in the field and boy, he looked, you know, he was a big guy, a good looking guy, and uh, you know, he had a lot of blonde hair in those days. And he could throw the ball like 100 yards. You know, and, uh, it was a cannon. And he threw the short ones. You know, the, you know, the, the only thing he had to learn to do was get some touch. Yeah. You know, he had <laughs> a great for delivery. But I remember one time at a steward camp in his rookie year, he threw a ball and it bounced and hit me in the leg. And uh, I went up and took my shower that night, and my leg where the bounced ball had hit me was all black and blue. <laughs> I mean, all the way up my leg. And, that stuff. and I, that's what it was. And I said, man, alive. Can you imagine? The, the, the receivers yeah, that were on catching a, these on balls. A, on a, on a rocket, ricochet. So the, one of the things that happened, I'm off the point here a little bit, any guys that we drafted, you know, you rate their hands. Like zero was perfect, and one was really good, two was okay, two was weak. They had to be zero or one. That's how you know Randy Grossman came in. You know he, he you know he was a zero in his hands. You know we, our our standards were so high for receivers. You know they had to be perfect or you know, you know, uh, you know a starter. But, uh, but but you're done looking at Bradshaw. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was looking at Bradshaw and, and he's the, throwing the ball. But I, I was talking to the, 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 the equipment guy, and I was saying uh, about Bradshaw, and this kid seemed to know a lot about Bradshaw. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, know him personally? Oh, yeah, I know him. You know his family? Oh, yeah, yes, I know his family. And, um, and what, what kind of people? Oh, great people, really good people, you know, good Christian people. And, so he get along with his father well. You know, I'm getting all that Freudian stuff. Yeah, you know, right. you know, don't get that stuff. You don't know anything about it. Oh yeah, yeah. He gets along real well with his father, and and, uh, and I finally said, uh, "What do you know a lot about him?" He said, "Sure, I know a lot about him. He's my brother." <laughs> <laughs> I was a, I was at an event uh, this this past spring, and Bradshaw was there. And that was the only thing he asked me. He said, "He said, remember that story you always told about when you went to Louisiana Tech and asked him to hear the." It was Greg or whatever his brother's name was. Yeah, and I said hey, I'll never forget that. Yeah, but um, but when you saw Bradshaw, I guess you thought this is something special. No doubt. I mean, you could have, my wife, my mom, or you could have sent your grandma out there to tell they you that could have guy. Figured that out. Yeah, he's special. Yeah. <laughs> and then you, you you watched all the films, and then everybody's rapping the teams he was playing against. You know, but that that was good football down there. Yeah, that's like we have up here in the Mid American League. You know, Bowling Green and uh, Kent State. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty good football. And then down there, they yeah, played Nicholas State. And, and yeah, football is important to those people. Yeah that, yeah, that was good football. So he was a unanimous choice. Yeah, I, I, I he was with us. You know, and he, he fly the ointment. You should trade him and get a lot of players. You know, and you built. Now, my idea, you built, you built with the gray ones. You start bringing your own guys in. Well, talk about some of the other scouts that you worked with. Uh, you talked about Bill Nunn, and what were their contributions? Well, well Bill, Bill was you? a um, was a great. Well, according to him, he was a great basketball player. I guess maybe he was. You know, down in West Virginia somewhere, he was uh, offered a uh, chance to play with the Globetrotters. You know, and uh, he, was, he was that good. But he, his dad was a uh, 
sports editor for the Courier, you know, the Pittsburgh Courier, the black paper. And uh, a little nepotism there, too. Bill got a job with them and, uh, and did a real good job. He ended up being taking his dad's place. But he had great, great contacts in the black schools. And I'll be darned, you know, as he, he was very serious about it. We both were, you know, and, uh, and uh, he, he really learned to be a real top scout. You know, he knew, he knew athleticism. And he, I'm sure he not a lot better than I did. He, he knew football character, personalities. He, he was a little bit older than I was, but he, he knew, knew a lot better. He, and Butler was that way too. They, you know, the, Bill, Bill always cut through the baloney. You know, he knew, you know, you call it as it was. You know. And then you went, ended up working with some other Scots in years after that. Yeah, I, I didn't. Some, you, some guys you learned something. They had a strength you learn off, and others. One guy named Fido Murphy at the, the Bears had, and we had, and were from Blesto. Uh, he was, wasn't bad on quarterbacks, but all, he was one of the strangest guys you ever went to meet. And uh, the real character, his wife was a. Uh, 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 an actress, and she played uh, like Jack Benny's secretary all the time, you know, in the TV shows. And uh, what was her name? She was really, she never called Fido Fido, it was always Ray. And I thought, I see her on TV even now, one of those old pictures, you know, on <laughs> Turner Broadcasting or something. And she was, she was a pretty nice gal, and a, a very pretty, but looked a little bit like a, you know, played all those rough parts, let's put it that way. And she was the nicest gal, but Fido used to uh, get all her scripts, you know, from the uh, Jack Benny show, and hit write her scouting reports on the back of the scripts. You know, he's trying to impress you, but uh, he, he was a super, super wacky character. And then we had a guy named Willie Walls, who was uh, Sammy Ball, the great quarterback's target while he was at uh, TCU, and um, he was a good-looking big old guy, part Indian, and he, he was uh, got in the movies. But he didn't like it. He didn't like that life. He went back to being a football coach. And uh, he, he, he would show me a movie once, and he said, uh, movie of a football game, and he said, look at that guy. He said, what do you notice about him? And I said, wait, he ducked his head. He said, he flinched. And always remember this, Artie. Artie. Once a flincher, always a flincher. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, he's damned if he says, does it once, he does it yeah. all the time. I don't know about that, you know. But, uh, but he was very opinionated. But they were, all, they, they, were, they were like great characters in themselves, you know. And, uh, and I think maybe in those days, anyone you could get to do that job, that scouting job, were guys that had some little flaw about them or some strangers. You know, like, you know, Willie Walls used to sleep in his car. You know, they, they, you know, the, you know the motels now. Yeah. And the, he'd sleep in his car, you know. And, uh, and we, um, Roy McHugh told me he thought one of the best chapters in this book was one that we did on, on Will Walls. You know, where Chuck, uh, not Chuck Noll, but Bay Parker, I was just breaking in, sent me on a uh, scouting trip to an all-star game. And Will was my, uh, you know, my instructor, took me up and introduced me to everybody and pointed out what I should be looking for and that stuff. And, but it was very, very funny. You know, McHugh thought that was a real good one. Yeah, speaking about Sammy Baugh, did you ever watch Sammy Baugh play? A lot of times, yeah. I just read a website that named him the best NFL player of all time, which I don't because know. That, yeah, that, hey, listen, he was a uh, the great quarterback and defensive back and a great punter. And, uh, you know, played two ways and punted the ball, too. And uh, uh, they, they, they always tell the story about him when I was a kid that you know, they didn't wear the face mask. And this guy came in and really roughed him up. And, he told the offense line, he said, open the gates up this time, I'm going to get a good aim on that guy. You know, he was a perfect, great arm, but perfect, you know, uh, accuracy. And they opened the gates up, and boy, this guy comes barreling at him, and he hit him with the ball. Right in he the face. Right in the face, and blasted his face all over the place. You know? <laughs> and and then, then I, I remember uh, my good friend Don Joyce said that uh, he, he was a defensive end and, you know, r rushed the passer and... Uh, and hit ball a couple of times, and ball was really at the end of his career. And, uh, and ball started to give Joyce hell, and he said, "If you're too old to play, you have to hang it up." And so uh, he called Joyce a bunch of names. And so the next time he ran in, and and ball grabbed him by his face mask. You know, Joyce 
Joyce says, and I put my hand up. Tom was a very dramatic talking guy. He had been a wrestler and that. He knew dramatics. He said, I put my hand up on, on Ball's, you know, right hand. He had it on his face mask, and he was shaking his head. And I squeezed it, and I felt the bones break in his hand. <laughs> and, 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 and listen to this stuff. And I thought to myself, he probably did that. But, you know, and what that would mean to a quarterback to break the bones is anything. That never happened. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you, you work with Chuck Knoll, and, and you, you picked Terry Bradshaw. Now, there's a lot of talk about Chuck Knoll and Terry Bradshaw and their, and their relationship. But what was Chuck Knoll like to work with from your standpoint? What kind of guy was he, and what did the players think of Chuck Knoll? He, he, Noel was a very, very good person, a very exacting person. He was like the toughest college professor you ever had. You know, the, taking care of the details and demanding, you know, you take care of the details. And uh, uh, he had a quick and sometimes uh, sarcastic wit that could really get to you. And you really want to please him because of his demands. You know, you could live up to these standards, especially your daddy owned a team and the reason you got the damn job is because of your dad. You know, you wanted to, <laughs> you know and, and, and you wouldn't tell him that you got him because of your mother. That would really have been bad. You know, but, but you, you always wanted to try to please him and you come out and say, you know, oh, I, this guy, I don't know about working with him and that stuff. And, but you'll be back, you know, next time we'll, you know, you know and uh, I remember he, he insisted on getting, um, college transcripts of the football players and I, and because the Colts did that and he said to Uppy Bell you know Burt Bell's son was the personnel director he got all the transcripts he wanted and they, why, why can't you do it so I told Jack Butler I said I'm going to get more damn transcripts, uh, transcripts than, than Harvard has on guys and we wrote everybody and we called on the phone and we, did, and we got all these transcripts and then it dawned on me I saw these you know the assistant coaches read it I thought, how many of these guys graduated from college or anything like that? You know, how the hell do they know how to read a transcript? You know what I mean? <laughs> so we had this one guy that Chuck uh, was asking questions about a little defensive back from Arizona State. And um, you look for certain courses, you know, the hard courses, not the gimmies, you know, not, uh, not phys ed and that stuff, but, you know, uh, you know the, the math, especially math. They talk math. You always looked at that. And so this defensive back from Arizona State, uh, we're looking at the transcript, and I said to Chuck, I said, well, I said, look, I said, this guy uh, gets all these A's in math. I said, you know, he has to be smart enough to be able to learn your plays and that stuff. You know, and uh, he looked at it and said, the professor at Arizona State was in the bag. You know, you know what I mean by in the bag? He was, you know, you know, they, they, they had got to him. You know, he was a football nut and that stuff. And I really hit the ceiling. I said, how do you know he's in the bag? I said, I said you know, he's a math teacher. He said, well, they're giving the grades to keep the kid in the team. I said, well, give him, give him a C, you know, give him a D, keep him on the team. He said, no, no, you just don't know how those things work. So we're having this argument about the, you know, the transcript. Because the, finally, a guy got a good grade. You know, he was saying that, well, th that didn't count because it was a fix. You know what I mean? And, uh, I said, man, a lot of you can't win anything on him. But he, he was uh, so, that's just a little funny story about it, but he was so exacting. And you wanted to live up to it, you know. And uh, like, like my wife told me, she said, anytime you have these scouting meetings, I spent a lot of time with Chuck Knoll, a real lot of time. You know, all these scouting meetings I had, spring and fall, you know. And then the film rooms and that. And my wife says, you know, it's always corpulent. You know, I should have been on a diet. And, and, uh, and my wife said, anytime you have these meetings with Knoll, the first thing you do is get out the fat book. You know, we had, you know, the instructions, you follow the things and keep these charts and diet. So every year you do this, you go on a diet when you're with Noel. So it was even into my eating habits, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I'd, you know, I'd start eating all the donuts. You know, we had all these carbs, you know, at the, hanging around, you know, while we were working and that stuff. And, um, and then I'd go on, a, go on a big diet because Noel was in the Every year you go on a diet with this guy. So you're you know? trying to please him. You're trying, trying to please him. And, uh I was never tight with him. I got to be very friendly with his wife, who's a wonderful lady, you know, Mary Ann. And uh, Noel ended up with an airplane, and I used to fly on his plane to the game. And then and he asked if Mary Ann could go with me. Then, it, you know, then we would uh, 
go to the Stewart game after. And we got to be really good friends. And uh, when she'd go with me, I'd uh, call, and uh, even schools you couldn't get in the press box. They'd let Mrs. Noel in, you know, the press box. So I'd get myself a good seat in the press box. You know, I'd talk about the players to her and that stuff. And, and she's a great lady, really a nice gal, you know. But I, I was always more friendly with her than I was with him, you know. I was always you trying work to, with him? Yeah, I worked with him. I was always trying to live up to what he wanted. I could not quite make it, you know, all the time, you know. Now, the 71 draft was rated, I guess, the fourth best in NFL history. and uh, That was really a very good draft. Frank yeah. Lewis, Jack Ham, yeah. Moon Mullins, mm -hmm. Larry Brown, mm -hmm. Mike Wagner, Glenn Edwards, Fats Holmes. And, and I think we got a free agent out of that one, too, maybe. Uh, well, I think, I think it was Edwards. Glenn Edwards. Glenn Edwards, yeah. Was that, that, was, that was one of the great drafts, and I know the NFL films rated the drafts. And I brought it up to them. You know, that was a real good draft. And they had... They had our 74 draft as the best, and uh, so they gave me some grief on that thing, and I, I wouldn't argue, yeah, because we had the best, you know what I mean? But I, I, think that was, uh, I think that was definitely the top ten. Well, there's two people in that draft I want, to talk, mm -hmm. I want you to talk about. The first one is Fats Holmes, and he was a real character, wasn't he? Yeah, he was as, so typical of his own worst I mean, He was a guy who was a great athlete. Great talent, great appetites, and he tried to satisfy his appetites. You know, you know, eating, drinking, you know, things like that. And I always got along real good with him for some reason. You know, and uh, I, I really liked that guy. You know, and uh, he, strong as an ox. I mean, unbelievable, super strong. I think you and have a story about he picked somebody up or something in the book. Yeah, I, he he. Uh, he picked somebody up, and I, I didn't know if that made the book or not. He picked up a, uh, in the dressing room, he pick, picked up a uh, newspaper guy and just held him there. And the guy was just a smaller guy, but not a midget. Yeah. And the guy got terrified because he had written something bad about him. He just held him there. And he just <laughs> terrified him, and then he put him jump, jumping down. You know? Oh, jeez. You know, but, uh, and he was a tough guy and really gave it, and he had a little bit of a sense of humor, you know, and... Uh, uh, and for some reason, I, I, I did like him, and I think he liked me a little bit too. But um, but without the personal mm -hmm. problems he had, do you think he could even have been a better better player than? Well, he was? a longer, you know, more you know, more consistent, and you know, Pro Bowl after Pro Bowl, definitely a Hall of Fame candidate. You know, and uh, yeah, he just had too many personal problems. You know. The, the other guy I want to talk about, my yeah, daughter. Excuse me, he intimidated people on the other side of the ball. You know, he, oh, I he scared him. I yeah. can imagine. Yeah. Now, the other guy I want to talk about is uh, <clears throat> my daughter goes to Penn State, mm -hmm. and she uh, just loves it up there, Joe Paterno. But, uh, but Jack Ham, Jack Ham was not your typical, uh, maybe he didn't fit mm -hmm. all your exact size and speed and everything. No, he, but he, 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 he uh, <clears throat> I remember him so well. He, he size, well, height-wise, he was okay, about 6'1". Weight-wise, definitely not. But we had a real top weightlifting program with a silver medal winner from the Olympics. Lou Ricky was our coach. And Noel had us convinced that he could put on good weight. You know, and Ham was a perfect example, but Ham could get to any spot on the chessboard. You know what I mean? And he was a real good hitter. You know, he wasn't He's a hard hitter, but not a vicious guy. Great, great vision. And uh, he's one of my favorite picks ever, Jack Ham. The perfect player. Who was it? Uh, oh, gosh, the guy. The guy in the old days, he used to call this perfect player. And I thought the perfect player on our team of that era was Jack Ham. Jack Ham. No, no mistakes. You know, had, had it all. And uh, I, I remember my cousin went to the... Uh, all-star game I, over in Hawaii. That Noel was the coach, you know, and, and he told my cousin Tim, who was a personnel guy, um, it'd be like his go for things like that. And uh, and they were putting the defense in, and uh, Tim was coming down on the elevator with the defensive uh, linebackers and that, and you know, defensive backs and. And they were complaining. They said, no one has this defense. You can't play this defense. You'll never be able to play this defense. But they didn't know who Tim was. You know, just a little guy in the elevator. And uh, one guy said, yeah, yeah, it'll be all right. And, he said, and this person said, how in the world is it going to be all right? You just can't do this. 
And the guy said, Ham. And the other player says, Yeah, yeah, that's right, Ham. We have Ham. Now, they're, they're future, a lot of them future Hall of Famers. When they realized that they had Jack Ham, they knew the defense would work. Boy, that's yeah. something. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. I, I grew up a Pitt fan mm -hmm. growing up in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. and now my daughter at Penn State. Yeah. I listen to Penn State football on radio now, mm -hmm. which I didn't used to do. I always liked Penn yeah. State, but now I really like them. Mm -hmm. But I listen to Jack Ham on the oh, radio. He's he tremendous. is fantastic. Yeah, yeah always has. And I, I thought tremendous. That, I thought that, um, well, he has a, evidently a good job in the real world. And um, and has that football, so I think he's satisfied. But I thought that he he could have been a uh, you know, top NFL announcer, and uh, I thought that he could have been a uh, a top coach because he's a he's a guy that you relate to, and uh, yeah, I, I, he was always one of my favorite guys. And, uh, Even interviews when you, he's interviewed, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, really tremendous yeah. guy. I guess yeah. he's as good there as he was on the yeah. field, huh? When he came into for us, you know, uh, our indoctrination period, you know, we had a little thing at the Hilton. We'd bring the players in, you know, and have a little gathering the, the night they got there, you know, with the uh, you know, sandwiches and all that stuff. And, and uh, so uh, the Scots ran the thing. You know, Ralph Berlin, the trainer, and the Scots ran this little, you know, night before the physicals and that. And, and this guy knocks on the door, and I go in after the door, and there's a guy in a uh, windbreaker, a pair of slacks, and a, uh, it's a shirt, you know, like I have on it. And um, I said, yeah. And he said, I was polite, but I said, yeah. And he said, I thought he was a, I thought he was a bellboy. He said, well, I, I was told to come here. And I said, oh, you have a message. I said, no, I'm Jack Ham. <laughs> And, I, and I, I said, oh, yeah, and he was so nice, but my heart sunk. Because <laughs> I had he seen a, him live. He thought but he was a always, you have, Yeah, I have a football uniform. And here's this guy came in, and he had a, I thought he was, seriously, I thought he was he, delivering a message. Did you ever tell him that? Oh, yeah, he, we have a big laugh about that. <laughs> and then, and then the, but the next day, we're weighing him. You know, and he has no clothes on. And his upper body was, you know, that he wasn't a chicken-chested guy or anything. You know, he had a square build, but there was nothing in the upper body, and his legs were like, you know, a guy out of one of the muscle magazines, you know hmm. what I mean? You know, all legs, you know. But I, that didn't worry me because I, I was so confident of Noel and Lou Ricky's and the weight program, program. You know, a good diet. And he, he ended up being, he was probably 212 then. He, got, he played probably about 225, 226. What a great you know. player. Now, now we're on Penn State. The next draft, I guess the 72 mm -hmm. draft, and I think this is one of the great stories mm -hmm. in your book about your first-round draft pick in 1972. It was another Penn State guy, mm -hmm. and you, you went up to see Joe Paterno, mm -hmm. and Joe Paterno wasn't exactly uh, singing the praises of well, him yeah, yeah, that's, but that, as that's much it. as he, his he, other guy. Right yeah, back. yeah. Uh, Mitchell, I guess, was the other one. But, Lydell Mitchell. But he, um, they, they would wrap him. But it was one of those things you talk about body language and that stuff. It was, I'd prefer to talk about uh, Mitchell, who could be a little bit of uh, the son in law type of thing we were talking about. You know, and Franco had um, some type of bad rap. And I remember we had Danny Radakovich with us, who was a, uh, our coach, who had coached up there at Penn State. And I think he was there a year with Franco. And uh, he was a real big help because he knew him so well. He just gave us the impression he knew him so well personally. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, I think someone says, well, Radakovich takes uh, a lot of the credit for uh, your drafting Franco. I said, I don't, I don't know if he deserves it or not, but I'll give him all the credit. I said, the important thing, we got him. And yeah. I know he was, he was there and really you know, boosting him. And, but uh, it was Robert Newhouse, well, and, uh, the, and yeah. they were trying to talk you into Lydell Mitchell, yeah. and Robert yeah. Newhouse yeah. and Franco were, yeah. were your and choices. All, and they were all good players. I mean, in pros, they were good players, but the only thing is that it's the thing we went talked about, greatness. Right. You know, I felt, Dick Haley felt, and, uh, and Scott's felt that uh, he, me and Franco, had greatness about him. And he made the great plays and the the big games and 
His senior year, he tailed off some, but he still had a real good productive year. And that's what Radakovich kept on saying. He said, look, he said, this guy's not a bad person at all. He's a sensitive type of guy. And he says, and his record, his production fell off, but it didn't fall off to being horrible. And so very begrudgingly, you know, Chuck uh, took him. And, um, and I, always, I always saw this part of the story. The next year, um, we were looking at uh, O.J. Anderson or something like that from another school in this little film room they had. And uh, Chuck says, uh, about Anderson, he says, I, I, he says, I'm probably wrong about this guy like I was that big fullback from Penn State last year. You know, that was, uh, that was his way of saying that, you know, you guys were right. You guys right. got it right. Yeah. But the thing is, Chuck Knoll was really on the fence about Franco Harris. And yes, you right. knew that he was on the fence. And you wanted him. And you went really extraordinary measures to, yeah, to I, 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 sell I kinda, him. I, I kind of did. I, uh, I wouldn't give up on it. And because uh, I had scouted him so much myself, I wouldn't give up on it. And, um, you know, I called around all the Scots, you know, and had recorded their voice. I, I mean, that may have been a little illegal, I don't know. You know don't worry about it now, what statutes of limitations are right. <laughs> And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and I called other people, and, you know, like Radico, which was still there. He wasn't even on our coaching staff. He had taken a job somewhere else, you know, and, uh, and so we, we did do that. Boy, am I glad. Boy, am I glad that that worked out because you're, you know, he held out, Franco held out, you know, and had an agent. And my dad was pissed at that. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, he was late getting into the orientation and Noel was mad at that. And I remember the, I, I be fuzzy on this, but I think I'm right. The first preseason game he got into, we were might, maybe he playing in Atlanta. And uh, he broke one of those, uh, 50 yard runs or something. It's like the other night we had this kid we have now, uh, what's his name? But he, he made a good run. And I, uh, you know what I felt good for? The Scots. Because, you know, he hadn't done this or that and he ended up fumbling anything. I'm talking about this kid, current kid. Mendenhall. Mendenhall. And, and he, broke, he broke it on two good runs. You know, things that it was not a product of the blocking, it was a product of being a great uh, right. talent. And I was very happy for our Scots because I thought I had the same thing with Franco and boy, that early preseason game when he broke that long when I thought, oh, this guy can be for real. Yeah. Now, looking back on all your drafts, uh, you just talked about Jack Ham mm -hmm. and Fra you really pushed for Franco. Now, Franco yeah. ended up to be, the, well, both of them ended yeah, up well, to be actually, incredible. Well, actually, Terry Bradshaw, too, but that was, uh, you know, convincing my dad to, to the, take the first pick. To, to take the pick and not be jumping on the bandwagon of trading them. You know. So what, what was your most satisfying out of, of the draft? What were the most satisfying draft choices that you look back on in your uh, career as a scout? Well, in the, in the, the Franco draft, I remember I was at Arizona State and I was sitting in the car with the, another scout because you know, it's so hot there. You know, we had the air conditioner just talking, and the guy was a good guy, a real good scout, and he says, Art, he said, I'm afraid you really made a mistake on that, that big back from Penn State. He said, uh, you know, Franco, he said, he said, he'll disappoint you, you don't have the heart. Yeah, and I did get a little bit worried. You know, you gotta learn you know, the courage of your convictions, too. And he became a great player, you know, and that was very satisfying. And in the 72 draft, when we got, or 71, when we got uh, Jack Ham. I remember a real good friend of mine who was a personnel director, not the same guy I was talking about, just with Franco. Again, it went to this courage of your conviction. He was telling me that uh, Frank Lewis would never do it. And Frank was a good player with us, but never per great, but he went to, over to Buffalo and became a real top, top player, you know, so he had some vindication on him. But, but then Ham, he said, uh, he said, it's just too small, he has no place. He said, well, you have to play him a strong safety. He'll never be able to make his linebacker, you know. And uh, he went through all the guys he knew. Well, that, that was a t draft of kind of, you know, that 71 draft, we had something maybe six or seven starters in Super Bowl games. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty good, you know what I mean? And uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I kind of take it as a body of work, you know, the... Uh, 69 through 74, you know, that, uh, that, that, could be, that could be as good as anyone's ever done. Now, 
the eleventh round that year, you picked a guy by the name of Jefferson Street Joe Gillum. Yeah, he, he Joe Gillum was a phenomenally physically talented guy and intellectually very good. Um, but he had some tra a tragic flaw to his personality that destroyed him and broke the heart of his uh, mother and father. Which and, was? Uh, well, Joe Gillum, of course, you know, but. Uh, but which, which uh, was uh, his uh, flaw? His uh, flaw was? Uh, well, he, he was an addictive type personality, and, uh, and they gave him a lot of help and support that uh, he could ne never, never kick it. You know, and, uh, in my family, you know, my dad's family, our family, we've, it was always alcohol. And we had some wonderful, wonderful guys. We loved them all, and they never could really beat it. And nowadays, with uh, AA and some of the drugs, I guess they, I'm talking about prescription drugs, they have that they can help people, you know, with uh, have the, the drinking problems, and now it's drugs and that. But, but in those days, uh, they, they just didn't have that. And, but maybe Joey could never commit himself to uh, you know, get over the drug problem. I, I know everybody's on me about waiting that, and I'll do great, and I get off the, the office. But one thing about being a fatso, you, you don't break anybody's heart. Yeah, I mean, disappoint a lot of people, including yourself, but you don't break anybody's heart. Yeah. And I think uh, in my own family and the Gilliam family, Gilliam family, I think that the, that's something the, common. Yeah, it's the, the, you know the broken hearts of people yeah. that love there, and they you know just never could it, just kick it and put it away and never get to it again. Yeah, and uh, we're winding down here. A couple quick things. Your cousin Tim, you hired him, and he became a pretty good help to you, didn't he? Oh, yeah, real big, and he had a great uh, personality. He could kid you on the square. That was a Rooney saying, you know, kid on the square, and uh, you know, uh, t t tell you some truths you didn't get mad at. Yeah, you know I mean, because you know, he could, a spoonful of sugar made the uh, medicine go down. And he was a good scout. He ended up having a career, you know, in uh, football. He. Uh, uh, he, he, his dad and my dad never got along. They were brothers, and Uncle Duke and Vincent. And uh, I remember when I went to the, to talk to my dad about hiring him, he says, well, see him give him a job somewhere else. And I said, well, I did. And they said, well, he's a Rooney. He should be working for the Steelers. What's wrong with him? And if you won't work, you know, you won't hire him. So I told my dad, and he said, hire him. He said, he said I don't want my name, our name, stand anybody's way. And he, we're never sorry about that. You know, we hired him because he went with us to the Detroit Lions and was their personal uh, director and then went up to the Giants and he, he had a real, he's retired now, he had a wonderful career in pro football. Yeah, interesting. Well, Mr. Rooney, these two hours just flew by once again. Yeah, it and, is two uh, hours, isn't it? You know, and I, I really enjoyed our, yeah. our discussion okay. and I thank you so much for coming. Fine, if you, that's, that's great. I've enjoyed it. I like to work with you because it's more of a historical thing. You know, yeah, it's great. Than, it's wonderful. And I appreciate you coming yeah. in and talking with well, us. Thank you for having me here. And I, and I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Mr. Rooney. You can order his book, Ruani, from uh, his website, artrooneyjr.com. And I'll leave you with this. Uh, please be an organ donor. I encourage you to be an organ donor. Leaving this life and giving the gift of life is one of the best gifts you can ever give. It's a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, I thank you for watching. I'm your host, Lee Adams. <clears throat> Take care, everybody.